we have not talked about, and this is very important, and I haven't talked about it, and I, I, I'm not going to develop, I'm going to do, do a terrible job at this. You need to take a course on Borgman or somebody that, that, that develops this more. Originally, when people were really, really, really old, be like before Moses, before 2000 BC, did a lot of the poetry and a lot of the legends and stuff come down orally? Is oral different than written? Is oral different than written? Noah gets off the boat. Shem, Ham, and Japheth are his kids. They come off the boat. They were on the boat with Noah. Do you think Shem, Ham, and Japheth ever told their kids about Grandpa Noah and what happened with all these animals? Okay, yeah. So Shem, Ham, and Japheth tell their kids. Now, by the way, would their kids be able to go talk to Grandpa Noah and say, hey, Grandpa Noah, Dad said this. Did that really happen like that? Would Grandpa Noah be able to straighten them out? Okay, do you ever have Grandpa straighten you out? Anyways, so, but then what would happen? After three or four generations, would the story probably migrate? Would there be differences in the story? What's one, of the pro what's one of the beautiful and one of the problems of oral tradition? When oral stuff comes down, does it change from generation to generation? Let me be more specific. Um, okay, my son gets back from Afghanistan. He's telling oral stories. He just didn't have time to kind of like write them down because he was getting actually shot at every single day he went out. They were shot at, okay? So he didn't take the time to write this down. So these are oral traditions. So now he tells them, he's got a brother, Zach, and a couple of sisters and stuff, and so we're sitting around the table, and he's a wonderful storyteller, and he tells stories, and so he tells a story, and all of a sudden, everybody is laughing their head off. He tells us something that was really, really stupid, and it was really, really funny, and everybody's laughing their heads off and things like that, and he tells a story. The children leave. My, my kids, okay, leave. Elliot turns now to the old man, me, and his wonderful mother, and question, does he tell us the same story? And when he tells it the second time, his parents are almost in tears. Question, was it the same story? Yeah, it was the same story. Question, did he leave out some details? Yes, he did. And when the kids left, uh, he dropped some stuff on us that just totally blew me away. Question, was it the same story? Yeah, it's the same story. Can you tell a different story? You know who's great on this? Dr. Graham Bird here. Did you ever hear him play the piano? If you got him, and he get, you get in his course, you say, hey, Hildebrand says, you gotta play the piano for this class. He plays jazz. So he'll play the same song, but does he ever play the same song the exact same way? No, he, he does jazz. And so depending on who you are, do you tell the story differently to somebody who's 12 to 14 than you do somebody that's, uh, say, 54 to 60? Do you tell the story differently? And when Dr. Bird plays the piano, he'll play it one way, and he'll play exactly the same song. You can hear it's the same song, but is it different? It's jazz. And so what I'm saying is, in oral tradition, do people jazz the story? In other words, you never tell the story exactly the same way. Noah tells it to his, well, no, it didn't tell it to his kids. His kids were there. The kids tell a story to the story down and stuff. Would you expect the story then to come down in variant form? And what Moses did, I think, is I think that Gilgamesh Epic is remembering, what Napishtim is remembering the Noetic flood. Only it's come down orally, and so it's got corrupted. What you have with Moses is that God comes down and says, Moses, let me tell you what really happened. And now you've got it from God coming, saying, hey, this is what really happened. Now, by the way, did the other people passing the story down, do they have the shell of the story? Yes, they do. But, they, but how should I say, God gives... You know, the interpretation, as I say, God gives his interpretation of the issue, but pretty much he did the interpretation, so it's kind of right. And so God tells Moses what happened. So therefore, I'm not surprised, I'm not surprised that there are echoes, that there are echoes in other cultures that remember the story of the flood. I'm not surprised. God flooded them out, and I would expect other cultures to remember that and pass it down. Now, my guess is they didn't know Jehovah. They didn't know what was going on with it and stuff, so they made up, well, what was going on? Was it Baal, you know, smoking out Asherah, or what's the deal here? I mean, you know, the, the gods fighting or what? So, okay, does that make sense to you then? So I would expect some of the stories to be similar, and then God gives Moses what, you know, 
the revelation from God. And so that's how I'd account for the genesis. That's how I'd account for the similarities. That's also how I'd account for the differences. Now, by the way, is oral tradition, is it beautiful? Yeah. In some cultures, uh, they memorize, uh, when you go back with Homer and the Iliad and the Odyssey, some of the people in Croatia and stuff have 1,200 lines of poetry memorized, and they, they perform it. And every time they perform it, it's, ah, uh, you know, some of you do theater. When you do theater, have you ever done theater one night, two nights, three nights? Question, every night, is it different? Yeah. It's, it's, it's the same, yes, but it, it's different. Every night you perform that, there'll be something a little different. You had a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. all the right. So after that point, wouldn't all the stories be the same? Right. So when Noah gives the story, his kids, they saw it. The story is the same. Now his kids come, and I want to say they probably check back with Grandpa. So the story is probably pretty close. Now they have kids, now Grandpa dies, and the parents die. Now there's nobody to check the story. And so the story, it's like if I told somebody here to say something and you passed around orally, by the time it got to you, it would be very different than what I said. So you know what I'm saying? Orally, the stories change. By the way, this, what I'm telling you is fact. We, we know this. We can compare, um, actually, in other cultures, creation cultures. The oral thing has been checked out. And, and but, well, you should just know that. I mean, if I, if I started something here and I told him three sentences, and everybody had to repeat those three sentences all the way. By the time it got to you, would it be the same or different? They would be different. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How long is it between Noah and Moses? We're talking thousands of years. I mean, I, 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 I uh, Jericho, Jericho, you just with the Battle of Jericho? Jericho, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a humongous uh, tower bedded there, it's 8,000 BC. And so that means Noah has to come before that. So then you've got 8,000 down to Moses' 1,400. So you got 7,000 years there. Stories can change a lot in 7,000 years. Gilgamesh epic, let's say 2,000. So we've got at least, at least you know, five, 7,000 years that it's gotta be told over. And my guess is it was much longer than that. But, but I can prove, you can't have it any shorter than that because you got to account for towers there in the city of Damascus. There's various places that we know, you know what I'm saying? So you've you, you got to at least give me thousands of years. Yeah. How many generations would you estimate after you know Oh, gee. No, I can't do that. As, well, let me just tell you, theoretically, I can't do that. Let me just caution you about something, okay? You say... You know those genealogies in chapters 5 and 11? Did you read the genealogies in Genesis there? No, no, no. Don't add those up. Genealogies have holes in them. They're not, when it says so-and-so is the father of, okay, let me just do Matthew chapter 1. Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, excuse me? Uh, Jesus Christ, the son of David, Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Jesus Christ, the son of David. Now, you guys know, David's what? Date. Give me a date. Jesus Christ, the son of David. That's a thousand years. Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham's what? So you guys know that. So, question, was Jesus Christ the son of David? See, he said no. I say yeah. You know what son of means? Son of means descendant of. Son of does not necessarily mean direct descendant. And father can mean our, well, you guys even say till this day, our father Abraham. Uh, like, you know, he's not really your father, is he? He's Dr. Wilson's father. So. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> so. Okay, that's, that was bad. <laughs> Edit that. Uh, okay. Now, but no, but you see, the point that I'm making, the point that I'm making is, you see what I'm saying? So when you go back into those genealogies in Genesis chapter 5 and 11, I will guarantee you there are holes there, and these guys are living 900 years anyway, and you've got, so you've got huge gaps. You can't do that. It's impossible. There's holes, and so, we, so I can't give you... An estimate. All I know is Moses is about 1,400, 1,200, and I'll tell you Noah has to be before, before 8,000 because I mean, we've got that tower at Jericho. So that's, that's what? 
almost six, 6,500 years, 6,500 years, how many generations, I don't know. And, and by the way, I, I don't, it's not just that Tower of Jericho, you're gonna have to push it back farther than that too, so. Okay, good questions, I just don't know the answer. Okay, now, was a Moses aware of, was a Moses aware of literature like the Gilgamesh Epic and the Enuma Elish? Well, you say, no, Moses was raised out in the desert, chasing sheep, he barely, you know, Moses didn't really know this literature and stuff. He was Jewish, he couldn't read all this literature anyways because he was Hebrew. And uh, question, was Moses ignorant? Actually, he, where was Moses trained? Where did Moses get his training? Out in the desert with the sheep? Egypt, he was tutored as Pharaoh's da daughter's son, okay? Would he have been trained in the wisdom of Egypt? Were, were the Egyptians exceedingly illiterate and, and a, a brilliant culture? And we're talking old Egyptian going back to Tahotep that I mess with and stuff goes back to about 2800 BC. That's like 1400 years before Moses was their wisdom literature 1400 years before Moses. Yeah, there was a whole, you know, old Egyptian, there was middle Egyptian, and, and Moses, there was a huge literary tradition prior to Moses. So Moses would, and by the way, would Moses have known about Mesopotamia legend? Were there, was there any trade between Egypt and Mesopotamia? Those are the two big cats, man, that's why they call it the Fertile Crescents. There was stuff going back and forth all the time. So my guess is Moses knew some of these stories and, and may have adapted them, adopted them, God, you know, used to, and to Moses to straighten it out. Could Moses have borrowed some of his stuff from these things, from these legends? And the answer is yes, he could have. And God, is everything that pagan people say wrong? Is everything that pagan people say wrong? Or do pagan people say some things that are right sometimes? And if they're right, can God include them in the Bible? Are there some pagan people who speak in the Bible and speak truth in the Bible? Let me do this. Are there even some donkeys that talk in the Bible and say the truth? Yeah, the donkey speaks the truth. Numbers chapter 24, or 22, excuse me. So, okay, now, this is the Toledot structure of Genesis. This is, I think, interesting, but it's interesting from a literary standpoint. Toledot means, it's translated King James, I believe. These are the generations of. I think your NIV, if you've got your Bibles, you may want to pop them open, because this is it's fairly interesting to actually look at how your Bibles do this. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, you've got one of these Toledotes. These Toledotes. This is the account of. This is the account of the heavens and the earth, what day they were created. Okay, this is the account of. And what you find is there are 10 Toledotes in the book of Genesis. So Genesis is broken up into like 10 sections based on this phrase, this is the account of. Is this how Moses breaks his own book up? This is how Moses, writing his book, breaks it up. This is his paragraph divider kind of thing. By the way, did Moses, if you went up to Moses and says, Moses, how many chapters in Genesis? You guys are smarter than Moses. Okay, if you went to Moses and said, Moses, how many chapters in Genesis? Would Moses know the answer to that question? No, he wouldn't. There were no chapters back then. When he wrote, he didn't write in chapters. Do you realize your Bible has chapters in it? Do you realize those chapters were added about 1200 A.D.? Now, by the way, again, I'm standing over here. I'm telling you the truth. There was a bishop, um, Dr. McCray was a guy I studied under, um, some rumor is that he knew this bishop personally. But 1200 AD, this bishop, and McCray always said that he was riding on a horse, and sometimes his chapter divisions would be up here, and sometimes they'd be down there, and sometimes he'd get it right. Are some of the chapter divisions in the wrong place? Let me show you an example of that from your Bible. Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Look at this. He missed the chapter division. Now, by the way, does this mean the Bible is an error, or does that mean that this bishop in 1200 put the chapter division in the wrong place? Now, let me prove that to you. Go look at your own Bibles now. Gen Genesis chapter, look at chapter 2. Chapter 1 is the what? Seven days of creation. But the problem is, seven days of creation, Genesis chapter 1, but where is the seventh day? Is the seventh day in chapter 1? No. 
The seventh day is, it says, and thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all the vast array. By the seventh day, the God had finished the work that he, was, that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. That's in chapter 2. The seventh day is in chapter 2. Should the seven days of creation be put together? Yes. And by the way, look down to verse 4. Now, by the way, does your NIV Bible, does your NRSV, does your ESV Bible divide between verse chapter 2, verse 3, and chapter 2, verse 4? Is there a space there? Oh, man, some of you are shaking your head no. Do, do a lot of your Bibles have a space there? There should be a space there, okay? That's where the chapter division should have been put because this phrase says, this is the account of the heavens and the earth. This Toledot structure is a dividing. This is what Moses uses to divide the narrative into his 10 sections. This is how Moses divides it. So there should be a little division there. By the way, do some of you have those mini Bibles where they put the text on top of the text up at the top so they don't do the white space thing because they're trying to get it real small? So some of them may have scrunched it together just not because they don't know it divides it too far, but just because they're trying to save space. But um, anyway, so actually go from 2.4, go over to, to 5.1. And here you'll see right at the chapter division in chapter 5, how does it start out? This is the written account of Adam's line. So now you've got the genealogy of Adam and that stuff coming after that. Go over to chapter 6, verse 9. You can see in my NIV it puts this statement off by itself. This is the account of Noah. So after chapter 6, verse 9, boom, you get a story about Noah and his kids. And then you go over to chapter 10, verse 1, you'll see the same thing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and then it goes on to a genealogy of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So this, this is the account of, this is how the book of Genesis is structured, using this phrase, Moses puts it in at 10 times and structures his book that way. So, the tablet structure. Did you notice while you were reading Genesis that you get a little bit of history and then it gives you a genealogy? What do you do? You read the history and then you hit the genealogy. What do you do? You skip the genealogy. You hit the history and then you skip the genealogy. History and skip the genealogy. Okay, is that how we read as Americans, okay? Um, were they more into genealogies than we are? Well, it's always your grandmother. So anyways, uh, your grandmothers and grandfathers always do the genealogy thing. But anyways, so history and genealogy, history and genealogy. You see how it oscillates in the text back and forth between history and genealogy. Well, it turns out somebody has developed, they dug up some tablets, they dug up some tablets. First of all, what did people write on back then? They wrote on mud tablets, in Mesopotamia in particular, mud tablets. And so therefore they took a pen and they stuck the mud and the mud dries and then you can read it. Mud tablets. Are we glad that they use mud tablets? What's the problem with paper? Uh, give me paper 500 years. What's wrong with paper? Paper ain't no more, okay? In other words, paper with moisture, what happens? It goes to nothing. It goes to dust, okay? Back to dust. From dust thou art, dust thou shalt return. Okay, what's the deal with, with, with tablets? Tablets, you put the tablets in these boxes and stuff, and then you burn the temple down over the tablets. You burn it to the ground. What does that do to the tablets? It fires them. What does that make these tablets? Hard as rock now. Question, do they last forever? And we dig them up, what, 3,000 years later, we dig them up, we pull a tablet out, and what is it? We, can we read that stuff now? Oh, yes, and so you all should take Akkadian and Ugaritic, and you can read the tablets and things like that. No, seriously, some people spend, go to the University of Pennsylvania, the guys, they don't let them out, they lock them down there for like half their life, and then after they spend half their life there, they give them a PhD. But anyways, sorry. Uh, but anyways, these tablets, these tablets are fired. Do you know how important it is that they wrote on mud for us? Because then we've got these tablets now, and we can read them after 3,000 years. What's the problem with papyrus and all the paper stuff? The only, way, the only place the paper stuff is going to make it, like papyrus and that kind of, uh, they wrote on uh, animal hides and stuff, the only place that's going to make it is down in Egypt. Why does it make it in Egypt? Because Egypt is very, very, very what? Dry. Dry. Okay? There's no humidity in the air. It's the Sierra Desert for, and you know, the Libyans are shooting that, and so it makes it even drier. But it just, uh, what I'm saying is that it's so dry that Egypt is the only place that papyrus really survives. And by the way, was it really good the Egyptians, did the Egyptians write on the rocks also? Did they carve stuff in rocks? That's really good for us too, because the rocks last a long time. God did some stuff in rocks too, um, with his finger. But anyways, this is how the tablets, this, this oscillation of history back and forth, 
You get that in the Bible, this history, genealogy, history, genealogy. And what this guy noticed on some of these tablets that he was reading was that the tablet structure was the front of the tablet, and then you have the back of the tablet. And on the front of the tablet, he noticed there was a title, a history, a colophon is like a scribal note saying, this tablet's mine. The genealogy on the back, so the genealogy was the back and the summary. So therefore, this, when, when it comes in our Bible, there would be an oscillation between history and genealogy. History and genealogy. Front of the tablet, back of the tablet. Front of the tablet, back of the tablet. So therefore, what he's saying is, does Moses' style fit the style of writing of that day? Would you expect that? Okay. So does this, you know what I'm saying? So this may be an explanation of why you have the history of genealogy. Now, by the way, do we know this? No, no, this is some scholar's conjecture. Does it make sense? It makes sense to me, but, but I'm not saying it's fact, okay? You know what I'm saying? This guy's conjecture, we don't know for sure, but, but it does, does seem to make sense. Yeah. What's the colophon? Colophon is a, like a scribal note, and it'll say, oh, you know, I am Shafan, the chief scribe, and this is my tablet or something like that, or, or um, you know, this was written for um, Zimri Lin, uh, he was king, and he didn't beat me up, so I wrote this tablet for him or something like, you know, some sort of scribal little note um, type of thing, yeah. Good.